What's up guys? Welcome back to CPG's Ask an Expert. I'm Kirsten Stone and here today with us is David Page. David is our Director of Technical Training here at CPG and we're going to get to know him a little bit before diving into all the technical stuff we're going to get into today. So tell us a little bit about yourself, David. Well, uh, I've been had a passion for vehicles and anything with an engine pretty much uh, since I was 10 years old and uh, did several jobs taught myself how to weld, how to build differentials, how to wire and plumb performance vehicles, started doing some high performance tuning. In 2005, I became part of the comp performance group working in our, uh, on our tech helpline. So um, I did that for a year or a year and a half and then had an opportunity to concentrate on the fuel injection division, which led me to where I am today in uh, supporting of customers, developing products, teaching and training how to use the products and how to use fuel injection in general. So you train both our internal teams as well as external guys in classes. What does that look like for you on a day-to-day -day basis? I love it because it's such a variety. Uh, I've got to work with some old seasoned, really smart individuals in our industry who have built engines for years and really know engines well, but now want to know how to use this tool called electronic fuel injection. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, I've worked with uh, young people just getting a start, wanting to learn more. Uh, in theory, maybe they don't have an opportunity yet to put it into practice, but they're just seeking the knowledge. Uh, and everything in between from installers, engine builders, dyno operators. Uh, got to work with Don Garlitz, which was cool. like a <laughs> highlight of uh, my career uh, when he got his first drag pack Challenger from Chrysler. Right. And got to go work with him on the engine dyno at uh, Stanton Racing Engines in uh, Kentucky. So what was amazing, and I learned something important that day, was he began to go out and pull spark plugs out of the engine. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it was like watching him go back to his heyday when he raced top fuel. Right. He was coming in and he, he came in and had a spark plug in his hand and he said, I really wish we could take a little fuel out of this cylinder and add some to this one. I said, Don, we can, we it's easy. Absolutely can, yeah. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah. So I showed him in the software. He wanted to do it himself. And you know, he's done everything in the drag racing world. Uh, he's a legend. Right. But to see him still have a passion for it and to see him link up his knowledge of engines with this tool that we make, right. it was amazing. So I've always remembered that when I'm teaching people because, um, merging those two together, that's, that's the magic. Right, and for so many people, uh, even today, EFI is still kind of like black magic, right? I mean, that's Definitely. something that a lot of people are still learning. And I mean, as tech savvy as he is, it's still new technology to him. Sure so is. And, it's amazing. And, and in our technical department, one thing I learned is we, we, we help people with all levels of experience. Right. And um, I remembered one day when trying to help somebody uh, that there was a time when I didn't know much. Right. And somebody took the time to pause and teach me something. And I remembered how important that was and I tried to encourage, um, at that time I managed the tech office, the other guys remember that. Right. You know, it's a privilege. Right. And you're passing it forward. That person hopefully is going to, you know, have that same passion you have and maybe teach somebody else. Right. Absolutely. So with that said, well, let's take a half a second here. You mentioned briefly before we went live, your start into, uh, my note says, uh, start into gearheading. Yes. You want to tell us a little short story there? Sure, sure. Uh, probably one of the things that sparked my passion was uh, when I was uh, about 11 years old, my dad had traded for this Honda XR75 motorcycle. It's like a 1978, and, uh, but it didn't run. So obviously, <laughs> I had a problem there, right? right. There was something <laughs> I wanted to have fun with, didn't run. So I just started taking it apart and looking at different things and, and uh, the carburetor was stopped up. So right, on, ironically. I, yes, <laughs> yes, carburetor problems, right? So uh, on the second attempt, I think I finally got all the passages cleaned out. I never will forget the moment I stepped on the Kickstarter and the thing ran and I revved it up. And uh, you know, I thought to myself, right, this is it, I can fix things now. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I still experience that same feeling I did when I help somebody solve a problem or crank an engine for the first time or watch somebody meet their performance goals with their, their project, uh, still does it for me. Right, there was that meme that we shared, I think a couple of weeks ago, where there's the little kid coming out from underneath the truck yes. and he's like, I've done it. Yes, that, <laughs> I, that, that same feeling. That is the feeling I had, <laughs> that's correct. I love it. Well, we just got a question actually from Kerry Smith. He says, what is the difference between 
tune 003 and tune 005 on the EZ system. Okay, so uh, that is a revision to the tune. The EZ EFI systems comes with a bass tune in it. Right. And uh, at some point there was a revision, and I think it primarily dealt with additional cranking fuel uh, based on some feedbacks from some customers. Either one eventually will probably run the same, but tune 005 is just the latest right. updated tune. And it's been around for quite a while. And if you have a system with tune 003 and you wanted to get it updated, just contact our tech support line and tell them you want to do that. They'll give you a return authorization number to send it in, and we can update your ECU to the newer tune. Okay. And, and so, go. just to clarify for those people who are listening at home, 003 or 005, those are just the base to get you started so you can start self-tuning. That's exactly right. There, there had to be something put into the system to get started, and that was the initial, that was the initial tune okay. that we used. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Ernie Jensen asked us, on his XFI Sportsman, he's in Denver, would you recommend anything special for high altitude tuning? That's a great question. One of the beauties of speed density uh, strategy, which is what all of our systems use, is that a core part of the fuel calculation is barometric pressure. Right. So the beauty of that is, you, no, you don't have to have any special considerations. Any, this, the same tuning that applies there will work correctly. And then if he were to drive to a different atmospheric condition or a different set of atmospheric conditions, it would automatically adjust because it's measuring that. That is a measured... Uh, right, it's that, an absolute That's function. correct. It's a measured absolute function. So if he goes to somewhere with really low elevation, which would be higher barometric pressure, system reads that, automatically compensates correctly for the fuel. And what if there are, I mean, are there any calibration issues with that ever? Is that something that we encounter? The, as That's far a as from me, not Ernie. <laughs> yeah, as far as different atmospheric conditions. Yeah. Uh, primarily spark. You know, when okay. you um, well, there's a couple of factors. There are more than two, but two that are easily addressed. Um, humidity. So when there's more water in the air, you can run more timing. Okay. Uh, that's something that can't really be automatically compensated for. That's something that the user needs to be aware of. Right. Um, especially in an application where they're pushing it to the limits, where gotcha. they're really trying to get the most you're power up on that edge. And you if want you're on the edge in a humid environment, <clears throat> and then you move to a very dry environment, you're, you're going to have issues. Yeah. Um, the other uh, would be. Um, I lost myself. What was the original question? <laughs> Calibration issues as far as... Yes, oh, so, so ignition timing, yes. Um, barometric pressure will have some effect on okay. how much timing you have. Obviously, lower barometric pressure, which is uh, linked or associated with high elevations, um, you have, you're basically putting less molecules of air in the cylinder, so it's kind of like having less compression. and. Um, you can run more ignition timing because okay. the burn is going to be slower. Very low elevations, very high barometric pressure, very dry environments, those are going to be, you must be very careful about running too much ignition timing. So those are for all of our guys out at Vegas and Acres <coughs> Field that are Excuse down me. where it's hot and it's dry and it's Correct. very low level. Correct. So, okay. Well, we will make note of that one. And thank you, Ernie, for that question. We sure do appreciate it. <laughs> For any of you who might just be tuning in, this is CPG's Ask an Expert. We are here with David Page, who's an EFI master here at CPG. So hit him with all the good questions you've got, drop them in the comments, and we will get them answered for you. Um, Ryan Waddell asked, can I use a two-step and a delay box for launch control with XFI? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, an XFI 2.0 has built-in two-step and launch control, so you can... Um, you can program when you're on a trans break or if you have your clutch pushed in. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I was working with Mike Finnegan on his uh, Blasphemy 55 Chevy yesterday. Right. And he's installing a switch on his clutch pedal, so when he pushes in the clutch, it activates the two-step. When he releases the clutch, it deactivates the two-step. And those are just simple trigger <coughs> switches that are being installed, or is that off of throttle position? Um, they can be programmed. There's an input on the harness that okay. you basically wire to some switch to just let the ECU know when you're staged versus okay. when you're making a pass or a pull. All right, and so, yes. either it's grounded or it's not? And it's either grounded or not. There's also 12 volt input, so okay. it could either see 12 volts or not, or it could be grounded or not. Cool, okay. Uh, and Adam F says, I was looking at EFI, but I'm running dual carburetors. What do you recommend? 
Well, um, dual carburetors, dual throttle bodies works just as well. Um, you know, uh, actually, when we go to the shows, that's one of the primary questions people come up. Can I run dual throttle bodies? Absolutely. Uh, right. It works the same way. You're introducing the fuel in the throttle body just as you would with a carburetor. Um, as long as you use this, tell the system how many injectors you have, that's really the only consideration. Right on. And so with that, do they have a separate part number or is it something where they're going to call in and they're going to get an easy EFI kit plus a throttle body? What's the situation? The, um, the base easy EFI kit uh, is for a single okay. and then we have a dual quad upgrade. So it's just one more part number you purchase gives you okay. everything to go along with a base unit. So you could have an existing single throttle body kit. You decide to upgrade to a dual quad, you just add the dual quad upgrade kit and you're good to go. Right on. And any of the techs in the office should be able to handle that. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Um, we have a question from Chris D. How hard is it to convert easy to XFI? The easy, well, to answer that question, there are two levels of easy EFI. Right. The easy EFI, the original system, and the easy 2.0. They both have a unique ECU. They both have a unique wiring harness. We have the XFI Street and the XFI Sportsman ECUs. Gotcha. Both of those are direct replacements for their corresponding level of easy. So okay. it's easy to make the upgrade. <laughs> yeah. The harnesses are the same. So if you buy the right ECU, you just unplug the easy ECU. You plug in the XFI Sportsman or XFI Street ECU and away you go. And now what is the difference between either of those corresponding levels? Um, the easy one is fuel control only, no okay. spark. Uh, and that is primarily uh, done to, in, to simplify the installation. Okay. You don't have to disturb your ignition system at all. Right. So it really makes it easier to install. If you want spark control included with your system, which is a great idea, then the XFI 2.0 and the XFI Sportsman are the level that offer complete fuel control gotcha. plus complete ignition control. As gotcha. Well. And the difference, again, for those of you who might just be tuning in, the difference between Easy EFI and the XFI systems, regardless of which level you're looking at on either, is going to be that the Easy EFI is the throttle body based self tuning system. That's right. So um, I'm trying to decide between sequential and bank to bank injection, says Tom B. What should I use? Well, uh, anytime sequential is an option, it's always the best. Okay. Well, sequential operation means one injector is fired at a time in the firing order of the engine. So the fuel is injected timed to the opening of the intake valve. Right. Bank to bank, we fire four injectors at a time. So it fires four, 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 four. It sounds pretty, cr pretty primitive and crude because you're firing the injector irrespective to the intake valves. You might right. be firing one injector at and a close, just sitting fuel. one injector at an open valve. But in reality, it actually works pretty well. Uh, if you think about a carburetor, it kind of works in a similar fashion. Right. It's putting fuel in the manifold and the fuel's following the air. Uh, but bank to bank really works well, but you're going to probably find a little bit better drivability and in some cases, a little bit better performance from sequential injection. So why would somebody choose one or the other? The only reason that you would choose bank to bank is one, you don't care. <laughs> it's you're, just you're, easier to get it's going. It's easier to do, but uh, sequential requires some type of cam signal. Okay. So without a cam signal, sequential is not an option for you. Gotcha. If you don't have any means of a cam sensor, which tells the system which cylinder you're on, uh, you can't run sequential injection. Okay, so. gotcha. Um, can I use a combined fuel pump slash regulator? They made a reference to a Corvette regulator. I'm familiar with this, yes. Um, what this question is referring to is uh, in the probably mid 90s to mid 2000s, uh, Chevrolet used a, a filter slash regulator. It was pretty neat. Uh, you could mount it in the rear of the vehicle. So the fuel pump pumps into this filter regulator and then right. there's a return line going back. It's fixed on about 58 PSI. So it eliminates the need for a return line from the front to the back. Right. You just have one line going to the front. Um, it's nice and neat and clean. Um, there is a slight drawback. With a full return style system, it can respond quicker to changes in fuel need, either an increase in fuel need or right. a decrease in fuel need. With this system, 
the distance between this pump and regulator to the engine, if there's a, a change ways, in need, yeah. it has to either fill that line or it has to consume the fuel of that line before the pressure change it's gonna drop. is seen at the throttle body. Right. That sounds bad, but the reality is that setup works pretty well, and a lot of people use it in street rods with no issues. It sounds like kind of an easy workaround install. It is. It is. It's kind of a shortcut, but it works. Right. Um, I would not recommend it in high performance, high horsepower applications, because those changes in need are more drastic. So what is the average guy working at? You said that that runs at a pretty steady 58 PSI. What is the average... XFI, I guess average XFI is tough, but maybe easy EFI. What kind of fuel pressure are they looking at? Well, the pressure that you, you want to run the pressure that's recommended for your injectors. Okay. The ECU doesn't necessarily care what fuel pressure you're at, but every injector is designed to run in a certain range of fuel pressure. Right. And if you deviate from the recommended pressure, that's okay, but you need to know what that injector now flows at this new pressure. Right, so a lot of the data that comes out about those injectors is going to be based on whatever that recommended pressure is. That's right. And you start to mess with that by, That's right. say, throwing a steady 58 PSI at it. Yeah, if you buy a 36 pound an hour injector, it's only 36 pounds an hour at some pressure. Right. Say 43 PSI. If you then run that same injector at 58 PSI, it's not a 36 pound an hour injector anymore. It's probably a 39. Oh. Okay. As long as you know what that difference is, you're still okay because you can tell the ECU what the what the flow potential is of that injector. And there's formulas you can find online that'll convert, that'll give you a theoretical flow change, and it works okay. But it's always best to run whatever pressure your injector <laughs> manufacturer recommends. Gotcha. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about injectors since we're there. I know that I had a question here. Uh, one says, how do I decide how much injector to buy? And that's coming from Josh B. Okay, so uh, fuel injector size is strictly based off of horsepower. Okay. Um, it takes a certain amount of fuel to make one horsepower. And this is, these are known values and uh, there's some really safe rules of thumb. <clears throat> For a naturally aspirated application, rough half pound of fuel per horsepower if it's a gasoline engine. Gotcha. But here's some factors you need to know. Like I said, a gas, what fuel type? Because different types of fuel will require different amounts right. per horsepower. Uh, if you're using a, a boosted power adder, supercharger or turbo, those will require more fuel per horsepower. Um, and then the estimated power of the engine. So if you don't know that, just uh, come up with a good estimate and we have formulas online, or you can just say half a pound per horsepower. That'll right. give you your total fuel need. Divide that by the number of injectors. So in a V8 engine, it's going to be eight. Right. And that's how much injector you need. One other factor is doing what I just said will just give you the total fuel need, but you really don't want to run your injectors at 100%. Right. Everything in life has a duty cycle, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we, want to, we would like to sleep eight hours, work eight hours and have the rest of the time to ourselves. Right. We have a duty cycle. We don't want to work for 24 hours. Right. Neither does your fuel injector. <laughs> so you want to take all those calculations and add at least 20 percent so that you bring your injectors down at peak peak horsepower you're only going to be running at about you know 80 percent duty cycle. And duty cycle when we're talking about an injector refers to there's like a plunger inside right? Yes. So that refers to the amount of time the plunger spends open and flowing? That's correct. Okay. Gotcha. That's correct. Duty cycle is just on time versus off time. Okay. Uh, and if you have a, you know, if one engine cycle at a certain RPM is being completed in a given amount of time, if the injector is open for half that time, that's 50% duty cycle. Gotcha. Okay. So let's say we've got a guy who has, <coughs> I don't know, it's a, a twin turbo and it's E85 and it's all of these factors. Okay. What's his best bet? Does he just call us? How does he figure out? Well, I mean, that's a lot of fuel needed at that um, point. If you look in the FAST catalog, okay, and I believe there's a sticky on our FAST forum about this, okay, it'll tell you what values to use, but basically uh, E85 application that's turbocharged, uh, it's going to use probably about 0.75 to 0.8 pounds of fuel per horsepower. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty drastic jump. Pretty drastic from... change. Uh, just for reference, methanol turbo application is probably used about 1.2 pounds. Oh, that's huge. And, and here's the primary reason for the supercharged turbo engines using more fuel. 
it takes power to turn a supercharger. Right. So you have to fuel not for your uh, net horsepower. You got to fuel That's for what the gross. thing's making, yeah. but then the power used to turn the supercharger is subtracted. Right. Turbo's the same way. You're generating heat in the exhaust to turn the turbo. Well, it takes fuel to make that heat. Right. So that's why it takes more fuel per horsepower for a given fuel for boosted applications. All right. This next one is almost a vocab question at this point. What is the difference between high impedance and low impedance injectors? Sounds like somebody's doing a little secondhand shopping yeah. online. <laughs> <laughs> so um, high, you could replace the word impedance with resistance. Okay. A high impedance injector has a higher level of resistance across the terminals. Uh, it's usually higher impedance is usually going to be uh, 12 to 15 ohms of resistance across the terminals. Low impedance injectors are usually going to be somewhere between three and seven ohms of resistance. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. <laughs> I'm just a, a technical guy that uses these systems. So uh, there are definitely people that could explain that more. But put in layman's terms, it takes more current to open a low impedance injector than it does a high impedance injector. Okay. So not all ECUs are equipped to operate low impedance injectors. Um, you know, uh, I know a lot of stories of people trying to use low impedance injectors with factory ECUs and they simply overload the components, the drivers that right. open those injectors. Burn and them up. <laughs> it lets out the magic smoke. Yeah. And once the magic smoke comes out, you can't put it back in. Yeah. Um, but high impedance injectors, on the other hand, require less energy to open and close. Okay. And they're compatible with everything. And um, the industry has moved pretty much toward low impedance. You can now purchase some really high flowing injectors that are still low impedance. Okay. Uh, just the technology has improved in that way. Gotcha. And so I would assume then that the fast injectors are? Yes. Uh, well, um, I think we may have a couple of the really, our 220 pound an hour injectors are low impedance. I think that may be the only ones, the rest are all high impedance okay. injectors. Gotcha. And then the fast system can accommodate yeah, either the, one. the XFI 2.0 can accommodate either. Okay. The XFI Sportsman and all the EZs are um, high impedance only. Okay. Gotcha. That clears that up. Um, what is the difference <laughs> between an EFI or a carburetor inline fuel pump and what about the regulator? from AJ. Okay, so uh, the difference in a carburetor versus an EFI fuel pump, I guess one thing to, um, I guess one thing to, uh, to think about there is what makes fuel pressure? Um, resistance to flow makes fuel pressure really. Right. The pump flows fuel and um, the regulator holds back a certain amount of that fuel to generate the pressure. So um, basically a carburetor style pump typically will not push the fuel hard enough to ever get the pressure up to the levels that an EFI system has. Um, <coughs> Lance Ward, you mean high impedance is becoming more common in high flow injectors? Yes. So, uh, looks Sorry like, guys, that may have been a stumble on our yeah, part. Yeah, it looks like somebody uh, clarified something there and, and he is correct. High impedance is becoming more common in the higher flow injectors where traditionally really high flow injectors were only available in low impedance. Now gotcha. you're able to get injectors from low to very high flow rates uh, with high impedance. Thank you, Lance, I appreciate that. Um, so, sorry, we're gonna hop back and go back to the uh, car <coughs> versus EFI fuel pump. So okay. EFI just needs a lot more pressure. It right, like. it just requires a lot more pressure and the regulator needs to be uh, designed to work in a higher pressure range. Right, than okay. The carburetor. carburetor usually three to nine PSI is a good operating pressure. With EFI, um, anywhere from 40 to, to 60 PSI is a common pressure. Right, and then as with injector, the amount of fuel pump or the amount of regulator that you would need is just dependent on how much fuel you need, right? You got it. So the same formula you use to figure out how much injector you need, that tells you how much fuel pump you need. Awesome. If you come up with a fuel need of 300 pounds an hour total for your engine, you need a pump that's capable of flowing 300 pounds an hour fuel at whatever your operating pressure is. Right. And that's another thing, guys, if you come across any of these calculations and you can't figure out how much regulator do I need, how much fuel pump do I need, whatever you might be looking for, feel free to call our tech line. Those guys are always happy to help 
uh, and we can recommend the right parts for exactly what you got going on. And what is the difference between XFI and XFI Marine? Uh, the XFI Marine is something we developed, obviously, for marine use. The primary difference is the case is, is sealed with an O-ring to protect it more from moisture in a marine environment. Also, there are added safety features. Um, there are a couple of unique uh, dangers with a marine application. They use water from the lake or the sea to cool the engine. Right. So they're pulling this water out of whatever body of water they're located in. And if something stops up that inlet and the operator cooling of the boats, stops. then you have no cooling. And uh, oftentimes um, that can cause damage before the operator can catch it and slow down and figure out what's wrong. Right. So we added a water pressure warning input so you can set water pressure, water temperature, and oil pressure warnings. And you can set the system so that if any three or all three of those are triggered, it will shut the engines down. Okay. It's really important in multi-engine boats because if you're going wide open in a boat with two engines and one shuts off, the boat's we going to want to turn yeah. that opposite way really hard. So what we can do is link the systems together so that any air on either engine We'll shut both engines down. You can set it to turn on a siren, turn on a big flashing light on the dashboard or whatever. But, right. um, but primarily safety features that are geared toward marine applications. Right. And when we say safety, then like you mentioned, we're not talking just about <coughs> safety to the motor, but safety to the operator. Because yes. a boat making a hard left out of nowhere is yes. a problem. Very true. <laughs> so that is neat. Um, will the color handheld work with any tune of the Easy one says Carrie. Okay, so uh, I think what he's referring to, there's a color touchscreen handheld. There is a unique, two unique different handhelds, one for EZ 2.0, one for the original EZ. Okay. Uh, the good news is when we design this new handheld, it's retro compatible with even the very first EZ EFI that we ever sold. That's so, cool, so it can be an upgraded <coughs> add-on. That's right, it's an up that we actually sell an upgrade kit that comes with a touchscreen and a communication cable to go with it. And um, yeah, just buy that and plug it in. But an easy 2.0 touchscreen is not compatible with an easy one, but okay. we do have one for that. Okay. Uh, Trent Goodwin asks, what makes you most excited about EFI? Uh, making power. <laughs> I love to make power. I love the sound of an engine when it's you know on the dyno or in a vehicle making a lot of power. Um, really, I guess to be more specific, meeting performance goals. Because what's amazing is you know, to, to one customer, super nice, smooth drivability, that's his ultimate goal. Right. That's why he's doing it. To the next guy, it's it's making, you know, 705 horsepower instead of 699. <laughs> you know, to the next guy, it's using our traction control features to control the progressive nitrous so he can, you know, go down a slick street without losing traction. So whatever that goal happens to be, there's ways to meet it, and it's exciting to me to help people meet their goals. Let's talk about that. There's a little something you touched on there, which is like nitrous control. I'm sure we can control a million factors with this computer. Definitely. So what does that look like as far as auxiliary functions? I mean, what's the craziest things that you've seen plumbed in on there? Well, the XFI 2.0, you know, over the years we've added functions, and, and really uh, that's the direction that has gone. Uh, we've got four stages of nitrous control, progressive nitrous control built in, right. uh, internal data logging built in, traction control built in. <clears throat> but the real amazing part is when you can integrate these systems. So when you can tell the system when the traction control is activated because it's sensed wheel spin, not only retard timing, but pull this nitrous Cut progressive nitrous, back. Yeah. And then when the so that's half of what's cool. But the real cool part is then when the wheel speed goes back under the limit you set, then it puts it it's back in. It's going to ramp back in, yeah. So that's pretty, that's pretty amazing stuff. Also, uh, built-in boost control works the same way. Right. So when it sees wheel spin, it can pull back the boost by controlling the wastegates. Right. When the wheel spin gets back under the level you've set, then it closes the wastegates and the boost comes back. So um, that's only possible when the systems are integrated into one ECU, and that's what the XFI 2.0 does. Yeah, that's really neat. I mean, just the 
having so much control that you can monitor through your logging, I mean, if you're you know, testing at the track and you can see all of those factors on the same screen, on the same graphs as you watch your pass, I mean, yes. that's, that's an exciting thing to be able to have that much it control is. at your fingertips. It is, yeah. Uh, so, Trey W. asks, how do I choose between Easy EFI and XFI? Good question. That has probably as much or more to do with the user than it does the vehicle or the application. What are the goals of the user? Uh, I would say if a person knows how or is interested in knowing how to tune um, EFI systems, I'd go with an XFI. That's where that's a good place to start, maybe an XFI Street or an XFI Sportsman. If you have no interest in tuning and you don't care how it works and you just want the engine to run, an easy EFI is probably the better choice. There are some limitations though. Um, really low manifold vacuum, which is associated with really big camshafts in smaller displacement engines. Uh, a self-learning system has a very difficult chore there. Whereas with the XFI Street, it's easy to go in. There's, there's some really simple tricks to make an engine, even with a real radical camshaft, have good manners. It's not going to start like your, your 2010 Tahoe right. because it's got a big, huge cam. But you can make it start as good as it possibly can with the way the engine is designed. Yeah, it's certainly a whole lot easier to have you know, startup fuel tables versus a carbureted setup on the, the same setup would yes. be so much more difficult because you're needing so much more fuel later on. That's so. right. And, and when, I'm asking, when I'm asked that question, which I, I ask often, um, I kind of go back to the fact that what uh, a tunable system is a tool. It's a right. tool that a person can use and the results are no better or worse than the person using it. That's where our tech department comes in. Right. And then our, our top tier tech support uh, that I'm a part of, that's where we come in where a person has a challenge or a question and we show them how to use the system to address that and now they've just gained a new skill. Right. And how to use that tool. And that's real satisfying as well. Right on. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, say you've got somebody who has always run carburetors because, you know, it's what we've always done and it's worked fine. Uh, and they are looking for the first time at maybe considering an EFI kit and they're concerned about the tuning factor. I mean, like you mentioned, Easy EFI is a self-tuning kit. What is install time and what is tuning time generally look like on that? Well, um, that question is completely relevant to uh, the application. Right. For instance, um, I might take three days just installing a wiring harness if I want to be very particular about hiding the harness and, and, uh, and how it's installed and mounted. Right. But you could probably get it all installed in a couple hours if you wanted to. Uh, it really depends on the user and what their goals are, what they want to do. Um, but I would say typically an easy EFI system is an afternoon, Saturday afternoon install to get it up and running. Okay. If a person wants to learn to tune, if they really want to move away from carburetors and go to live tuning, the XFI Sportsman, the hardware is ultimately the same. There's gotcha. no difference in the install. Uh, and Brandon Flannery is asking, does EFI work well during an eclipse? I'm going to say, Brandon, from my understanding, this is not a Y2K situation. The computers should survive the attack. So. Um, with that said, Mark Campbell asked, can you please explain how dry nitrous works on an EFI system and why it's better than a wet nitrous system? Many people don't understand this and how it works. I think that, is that up for debate? It feels like something that's up for debate to me. Well, I, 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 I go back to this as a tool. Right. And one of the benefits of EFI, uh, dry nitrous is basically where the nitrous system is only delivering the nitrous gas. Right. The fuel, gasoline, methanol, E85, whatever, it's being delivered by the injector. So you have so much better control. And if you want to make a change, you change it with a keyboard, not with jets. Right. As far as the fuel side. Um, also, <clears throat> you can build a fuel table that'll compensate for drop in bottle pressure throughout the run. Um, another great benefit is now you've got an O2 sensor that can make corrections. So if you miss right. the fueling a little bit one way or another, it can either add or take away fuel from the delivered fuel. So uh, dry nitrous to me, um, if you understand it, 
and you know how to use it, it's way better. Totally counterintuitive to what I was anticipating. <laughs> like, I always thought that wet systems where you see, I mean, the full on, I mean, it seems like solenoids and jets have plugs everywhere. It seems well, like that would be the the way to go, but well, I mean, this it's is an prob- interesting take on it. That's probably a good, uh, a good example of the trust. Right. So there's trust required with a system. Uh, and, and I see that trust develop with knowledge. When people get more knowledge, uh, they trust that when they activate the system, it is actually going to add more fuel, right? Right. Because with that, when you have a, a the jet dual for each, jetting system, you know it's going to open this soloid and fuel's going to flow. Yeah. Um, but it does take trust, and knowledge is the only way to gain that. Uh, gotcha. When I didn't understand anything, we don't understand. Uh, we're not sure what's going on inside that magical box. Right. But once <laughs> we break it down and understand how to control it and use it like a tool, then we know it's going to do what we tell it to do, and we have, you know many, many customers with a lot of success with dry nitrous. Uh, uh, There's been some real advancements in applications. People taking it with the the increased popularity of no prep races (coughs) and uh, traction limited events. Um, Everything is a small tire, no prep. (laughs) Everything is being called upon to uh, have better control than we've seen and it does a great job. That's really cool. Thank you, Mark, for asking that question because I'm getting learned up real good here today. Um, let's uh, do a question from Brian H says I'm thinking about adding a turbo to my small block Chevy with easy EFI this winter how much power can it take okay trick question this is like the my cousin Vinny uh, question from <laughs> yeah. Marissa Tomei so you can't use a boosted application with an easy EFI because it's only designed to work with a one bar map sensor oh so it'll only basically recognize from vacuum to atmospheric pressure. So uh, to use Boost, he would have to upgrade to an XFI Sportsman or higher level system. Right. But <coughs> the fuel limitation of the Easy EFI throttle body, it flows enough horsepower or it flows enough fuel for about probably only 500 horsepower. An Easy 2.0 throttle body will flow enough fuel for boosted uh, probably about 1,000 horsepower. Or you could go to a multi-port, but he definitely is in for some upgrades to probably hardware and ECU to go gotcha. to a turbo application. Okay, so the answer is no, um, <laughs> or maybe, <laughs> All that to say. or yeah. yeah. Um, but definitely, it is a doable setup, and like you mentioned, the harness is right. there. It's just a totally different thing that we're doing. Yep. Uh, so the I had a question for you, spinning off of that, and now I'm blanking on what the heck it was. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about the, um, we talked about auxiliary systems. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I've completely lost my train okay. of thought. Okay. Um, so if I, that's what it was, if I wanted to learn, learn to tune, like I mean, I, you've personally taught classes that I've sat in on mm-hmm. and I mean, they're great. What does the average guy need to learn to tune? Let's talk about that because I feel like that's becoming so popular. Well, um, the foundation is important. To really tune well, you need to have an understanding of how the system works. Why why does the air temperature sensor matter? Right. Why does the throttle position sensor matter? What actually happens in the system as a result of those changes? And it's not nearly as mysterious as many, including myself, think before I knew. Right. You know, it's this magic box, and I don't know what goes on in there, but, you know, some people seem to have luck with it, some don't. But once I learned and broke it down... um, I understand how it takes all those readings and it provides the correct amount of fuel to the engine, basically. So whatever training you do, which we offer training here through CPG, uh, we're actually in our training center today. Um, There are other outlets for training for EFI tuning, but make sure you you, um, enroll or enlist some kind of training that covers the basics. Once you know the foundation, then it's just a matter of learning how to navigate the software and understanding the strategies used for whatever system you're using. Obviously, right. I obviously like the FAST system, <laughs> and it's the one I'm the most familiar with, but there are others out there that work, uh, that do the job. Um, but yeah, and then also there's a lot of books. There's there's books out there written uh, by some pretty uh, smart people. Ben Strader with EFI University has written some. Uh, Greg Banish has written some uh, tuning books that you can pick up at, you know, at any bookstore or online. And uh, those are great, and some people learn well that way. Um, but I would recommend books, 
training classes, then go get your hands dirty. Right. Get that was one of the things that I really picked up in the class that we did here was it's all great to pick up in theory and you can read all the internet forums you want and you can be in all the Facebook groups that you want, but until you really start to play with it yourself, it doesn't quite click the same that's way. Tr that's true with anything. Yeah. And that was, I mean, it's incredible how much you can learn in a couple of days about tuning, you guys. Uh, so with that said, tell me the, the craziest tuning story that you've, you've dealt with. Hmm. And guys, while David is thinking, I'm going to remind you, this is CPG's Ask an Expert. If you have any questions about EFI, we are here today with David, who's our EFI master, and we are just picking his brain on EFI. So go ahead and drop a question in the comments and we'll get to it. Probably the most interesting experience I ever had, um, other than getting to meet and work with Don Garlitz, which right. was amazing, but um, I've got to uh, provide support for some of the Engine Masters Challenge teams okay. uh, at that um, popular hot rodding used to put on in Lima, Ohio at the University of Northwestern Ohio. Right. Basically, for those of you that don't know, it's a race for engine builders. And uh, John Kazi Racing is one that I got to work with, but I overheard him talking to somebody and he said, you know, we build engines all the time, sell them to customers, they go race, they get to enjoy the, the triumph of winning. <laughs> right. And the, you know, the defeat as well sometimes, but he said, well, you don't get to experience that. He said, this is my chance to come race my work. Right. And a lot of the top engine builders showed up and you saw some really great innovation, some really great ideas, and I got to help them uh, a couple of years, one of which when they won the event, which was, you know, a highlight of my career just to get to be associated with those, right. that level of, of uh, really just an innovative mind in our field. So right. that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. And those contests, I mean, they're nuts. Like the, oh, the yeah. whole environment when you're there is so incredibly overwhelming yes. and there's so much going on, but it's amazing the work that they can do in such Absolutely. a short period of time. So uh, with that, you guys, I'll give you a couple of more minutes to ask any questions that you might have about EFI. We're just going to wrap it up <coughs> here with David. Um, tell us a little bit about the actual like training processes that we have in place. So. Sure. How, how do people go from help, I don't know what I'm doing, to a, a tuning master? Well, the first, uh, you know, as far as using the products, obviously we provide tech support. Right. We've got a toll-free tech support line, then we have, uh, you know, we've got live chat, we've got email tech support available, uh, we've got the top-tier tech support, which a few of us uh, help to uh, provide support on that level. But then we, we have offered training classes, and that's ever evolving. We're always developing new classes and uh, developing more advanced classes right. and working to provide the experience that those people are hungry for, right? They, right. We've got some people that know the basics and know how to basically do it, but they want to go to the next level, and we're working to provide that kind of experience for them. Well, that's something, whether it's in training or whether it is in um, the actual hardware that we're developing or whether it's in the camshafts that we're developing here, whatever it is, there's one thing that we know is that we can always expect our customers to be the ones pushing us to keep pushing even further. Like the people that actually use the products, uh, they have a unique way of <laughs> figuring out how yes. they need to go faster. And, and it's always been that way with the, even with the, with the valve train side of comp cams uh, from the early days of some of the NASCAR teams that we worked with way back in the, you know, the early to mid 70s you know, they would come and ask, you know, either uh, we need parts that are stronger or right. we need to make more power. You know, we've plateaued with what we got, help us go to the next level. And our engineers would go to work and, because without that, we think what we have is great, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Like, this cam works good, it makes a lot of power, until a guy comes and says, man, I've, I've maximized the potential of what you had, you gave me, now I need the next one. Right. And, you know, we've got pictures in our hallways of champions from every form of racing uh, that have asked for that and we've provided it. And we do the same with electronics. Our engineers are constantly developing the next level and the next. And, and there's so much going on I wish I could really talk about. But right. <laughs> uh, you Well, know. I mean, when it comes down to it, uh, we all are here full time in the office and we have to rely on real life race car drivers. Because even if we all think that we're real life race well, car drivers. Well, some of you are stuck here in the office. <laughs> Others of us Thanks. have to go out on the road it often. It hurts. <laughs> but no, but, but that is one of the parts of, uh, of our jobs is we do 
sometimes get to go out in the field to help a customer or work an event. And man, we just come back with a wealth of wonderful input from customers. And here, here's what I liked, here's what I didn't like, right. here's what I'd like to see. Um, and that's what helps us grow. Right. I mean, every one of those things is something that we can look to incorporate somewhere along the line. Definitely. Uh, you guys, we're going to keep going for just a couple of minutes here. If you have any questions about EFI, please make sure and ask them. If you're watching after this feed has wrapped up live, you can still ask your questions. We're going to continue to force David to the keyboard to get back and answer all of those questions as well. So um, Carrie Smith has asked us, you mentioned about having the correct color handhold for an easy one. How can he tell the difference between them? Uh, when you power up any, either of our handhelds, there'll be a splash screen we call that comes mm -hmm. up and it's basically like a, an image and it'll say easy if I, or I'm sorry, the easy one will say easy fuel. Gotcha. Because that unit doesn't control spark, it's fuel only. Or it'll say easy 2.0. Or uh, if it's, uh, we have an E dashboard which is the XFI, is right? a monitor for the XFI level systems, and it'll come up and say E-dash. Gotcha. So when you power it up, uh, it'll come up with a, a screen that'll indicate what product it's designed to communicate with. Awesome. Okay, so Carrie, hopefully that clears that up for you. Um, there's a whole bunch of comments in here, just so that you know. We have to continue to feed his ego, you guys. Alan Hutchison and uh, Jason, there's a lot of David Page, you to man. Yeah, yeah, I can't go wrong with the XFI. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I would tend to agree with you. And Jason uh, is one of our, what I call my G-body brothers. Oh. There's a brotherhood. <laughs> there's a brotherhood, if you don't know, of the G-body racers. Uh. And Jason's got one of the nicest and fastest G-Body cars out there, so nice. thank well, you very Jason, much. Jason, good work with it, I suppose. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I'm assuming it's a car that you've been involved with the tuning on, so that's, that's pretty cool. We appreciate you stopping by, Jason. Um, you guys, if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see in a future episode of Ask an Expert, make sure you drop that in the comments as well. So we did uh, basically the Cam Basics with Billy Godbold. And we've been doing EFI here with David Page. If you have any questions, feel free to, again, drop those in the comments. But also feel free to suggest future shows and what you'd like to see. And at this point, we are going to go ahead and wrap it up and let David get back to his busy day of tuning. What? Oh, wait, we've got a last minute question in here. What is the youngest person to install an easy EFI? I thought I heard at one time a kid installed one. A kid certainly could. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I haven't really been involved. But nothing's better. I mean, I was ten years old. Yeah. If if there had been such a thing as an easy EFI when I was it ten years no old, problem. I would have definitely been trying to put the thing on. Yeah, I mean, it really is for those of you. Again, this is just following up on Trent's question about youngest person to install an easy EFI. Um, I mean, it's as simple, really, as pulling off a carburetor and bolting something else in its place. Sure. Um, the only exception being fuel lines, and that's easily workable, too. Definitely. So, um, Trent, we are challenging you and your brand new baby mm. girl. I mean, I know she's only a few weeks old, but she should be ready to get on that install anytime yeah. here. Yeah. So, if you could just get Charlie on that, that would be excellent. We'd yeah. really appreciate that. We're going to need a video. Yeah. Uh, and with that, you guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this edition of CPG's Ask an Expert. You've been hanging out with me and David Page. He is our EFI master. If you have any more questions for him, feel free to drop them in the comments, and we'll make sure that he gets back to them. Thanks for visiting, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.